What is up? You have found I Like the Blazers. I am your host, Brandon Goldner, and I am super hyped to share with you that our guest today is a writer and editor from Blazers Edge, old friend of the show of many different shows, Eric Griffith. I mean, he's been on when I was on the Trailcasters, when I was on the Blazers Edge Weekend podcast. He's been on on all that stuff. Um, You can find his work at Blazers Edge or find him on Twitter at Eric G underscore NBA. I think I'm getting that right. Uh, We talk about the Blazers, their three and five start, talking about Damian Lillard, and maybe he's being played too much as well as as he has been playing, which has been encouraging. Whether the Blazers should be considered a contender uh, or whether their lack of depth is going to get in the way of that. Uh, CJ McCollum's inconsistency, same thing with Hassan Whiteside. We went through some potential trade possibilities and also the influence of Paul Allen and Jody Allen on uh, Neil Olshay's decision-making from a personnel standpoint. Got into all that and a little bit more, um, and I don't want to delay too long, but wanted to very briefly give my opinion about Anthony Simons having watched this game against the Clippers yesterday in Los Angeles, pardon me, a game that the Blazers almost took away and almost won where Anthony Simons had an amazing fourth quarter from a scoring standpoint. But I did want to mention that watching this game, if you're thinking about Anthony Simons as a long-term piece, this game should be encouraging to you as a viewer and as a fan. It wasn't just his offense where he displayed Uh, kind of the range of different his ball handling his passing his finishes off the window and in traffic his three-point shooting but also his defense which I did mention with Eric during the interview towards the end he looked good defensively his rotations were crisp his closeouts were really strong I think that Anthony Simons is going to be what the Blazers want him to be maybe not this year right away but at some point in the not too distant future. And the fact that he's getting these important rotation minutes against really good teams is I think a good sign for the long-term health of the team. There's a lot that could happen between now and the end of the season from trades to injuries to the Blazers or to other teams. All sorts of things could happen. We don't know where this is gonna shake out, but Eric and I did talk about that and it was a fun interview. Uh, So without any more delay, let's get this interview with Eric Griffith of Blazers Edge. Eric, what is up, man? Thanks for joining. How's everything going and on the East Coast? The wrong coast? The incorrect coast? <laughs> well, it was snowing a minute ago at my office window, which is never a good sign in the first week of November. So <laughs> Yikes. that's how it's going. Uh, it's funny that you say that because Portland has had the longest consecutive streak of non-rainy days in November ever. Um, so what? yeah, climate change is not not cool. So it's been, it means it's been beautiful. It's been super dry and like very pleasant, but uh, probably not good in the long run. But we're not here to talk about the weather or meteorology or climatology. We're here to talk about the Blazers. Uh, so the Blazers find themselves at three and five with some disappointing losses and some milk toast wins. I just wanted to start by kind of blowing this up pretty general. From what you've seen so far, what are one or two things that jump out at you as being kind of the biggest reasons or most important reasons why the Blazers are playing as well or as poorly as they are so far this year? So I think on the positive side, they still have Damian Lillard. He's still playing at his peak. This is possibly the best basketball he's played. And a lot of people are criticizing Terry Stotts' game plan, but I think he's actually choosing the best possible game plan on a game-by-game basis in that he's just giving Dame the ball and saying, do what you can with these jabronis that are on the court with you and that's what dame's doing i'm so glad you snuck that word in there for old time's sake i very much appreciate that (laughs) yes the follow-up to that is dame is playing with a bunch of jabronis and (laughs) it's hard not it's hard not to notice how shallow the depth on this team is when they were supposedly supposed to be competing for a championship and they have one injury and we're looking at an empty roster spot, Pau Gasol and Anthony Tolliver playing center. That's not great. Not great at all. I wanted to ask quickly about the Dame thing because he is, I mean, he's playing really, really well. He's also playing the most minutes he's ever played since his rookie year. I know it's only eight games. We're early into the season. Are you at all concerned that Damian Lillard is being asked to do too much? And particularly, as you said, with the injuries that he might be asked to do too much moving forward or is what he's doing does it look relatively not just sustainable, but that it won't be 
bad news for him moving forward. Cause I mean, he gets, he gets an injury or two the last couple of years. He's had some like kind of wear down type of injuries. He's needed to take a little bit of time and just, he's, he's slowed down at certain points. Or is that a concern for you? I, I absolutely agree. I think it's, it's so I have to figure out how to phrase this exactly right. So I think leaning as hard as you can on Dame is on a night to night basis on any individual game, the best choice, because it gives you the best chance to win that game. But in the long run, as you're like, like you're talking, we saw in 2018, they won 13 consecutive games, but Dame was not healthy going into the playoffs and they got their butts kicked. And I see the same thing happening here where they're, they're giving themselves every chance to win every single game, but they're leaning too hard on Dame. And I'm almost worrying if this triumvirate that has had a lot of success together, Dame, Stotts, and Olshea, are they're kind of they're kind of reinforcing each other's worst instincts because they're like, oh, we can lean hard on Dame. And Dame's like, oh, I want to be leaned hard on so I can be in the MVP convo. Stotts is like, oh, I want to lean hard on Dame because we can try to win every single game. Olshea is like, I want to lean hard on Dame because he's the best player I have. And that, to me, is a dangerous a dangerous assumption that this is the best possible path for the franchise in the broader scale. So what can they do about it in the meantime? I, spoiler alert, I don't think they can do much of anything because, like you said, they don't have a ton of depth. Is this, like, and for this, like, you're right. During the offseason, there was a lot made of, oh, this is the deepest team the Blazers had in a long time and a lot of chatter from the team itself about how their sights are set on championship contention. And I think that that was with some assumptions, assumptions that Zach Collins would play better and he's going to be out for many months, that Anthony Simons would play better, that Rodney Hood would be assimilated a little bit more, that they would get something from Anthony Tolliver and Mario Hazonia and Kent Bazemore. Um, I, I, this is a bit, this is, this is the rambling that you didn't want to get into when we were talking pre podcast, but let me try to sharpen the focus of this question. Given that, well, Dan- no, no, I think I can, I think I can already answer. And Great. I, I think this team, the reason I'm bringing up the off season and talking about Olshay, Stotts, and Dame is because there's nothing they can do now. This team was built, especially while Nurkic is out, especially until February 1st or whenever. This team was built so that they have to lean on Dame as hard as possible. And so I don't think there's anything they can do now because that was a decision that the the, the system or that the the organization made over the summer and i don't you know it's, i'm sure it's partly O'Shea's fault i'm surely it's i'm sure it's partly dame's fault i'm sure it's partly stotts's fault and so i would i'm kind of looking with a little side eye at the entire organization that no one spoke up and said maybe leaning on dame this hard again isn't the best possible path well and there has been some bright spots in those other players and some not so bright spots and actually someone who I think is avoiding criticism more than he should be right now. And I'm curious if you agree with me is CJ McCollum, who is again, not off to the best start this year. His scoring averages look fine, but when you even take a a shallow look into how he's doing his effective field goal percentage is by far the lowest of his career. He's only shooting 40% from the field, only 34% from deep. And you don't need to go into the stats to see that he doesn't look to be as impactful as he is at his best and and certainly as as he was at times during the playoffs do you think that some of this could be maybe helped if cj were just to play closer to his career averages is that could that help unlock some of what might get the blazers through this this period where they they don't have the depth yeah it absolutely could and i'm not really a lot of people are are kind of befuddled by this but i'm personally not because cj has always been a very inconsistent player and that's that's kind of his identity at this point and so i have little to no doubt he didn't just magically forget how to shoot over the last six months or whatever so i have little to no doubt that by january 1st his averages are going to be very close to his career averages he's going to be scoring 23 points a game on decent efficiency not really getting any very many assists and not getting any free throws but providing a scoring punch that's the player he is at this point it didn't suddenly change and so i'm not worried about cj like in the slightest yeah And I think that's probably the right way to look at it. And again, we have a ton of data to suggest he's going to get better. I want to get back to CJ in a second, but first I need to talk about Hassan Whiteside. I have to do it. Um, Did you get a chance to watch the game yesterday against the Clippers? I did. Okay. So, so if you watch this game and there were even some national writers who admitted that they didn't watch the game because they're traveling. But one of them yesterday on Twitter was like, can someone tell me why people are talking so much shit about Hassan Whiteside? Cause I looked at the box score and it looked like he did great. Um, watching this game yesterday 
and watching him play in the first half was deeply, deeply troubling to me. He did play better in the second half. Uh, his 19 rebounds, many of those were very empty. Um, but again, watching him in this first half uh, was just bizarre. And I know there's been some reporting that Damian Lillard talked to him in halftime, and that was part of the reason why he did better in the second half, which is good. How concerning is it for you when you're watching Hassan Whiteside play, ignore the box score? Are you as concerned as I am? Because I have to admit I'm pretty freaked out at this point. Absolutely. I think the, and I took a lot of heat when I blogged about this over the summer, but I think this partnership with Whiteside was entirely contingent on Damian Lillard and Terry Stotts being able to do with Hassan Whiteside what they did with Anus Cantor. They took a guy who literally couldn't play for the Thunder and they got him to outplay Steven Adams and made the conference finals with Enos Cantor as the starter. That is some like pure basketball wizardry from Dame and Stotts. And this white side partnership, I think was predicated on the idea that they could do something similar with Hassan. And so far that has not been the case. No, it has an end. Like I, I think for me, what's so frustrating it's not just a matter of he is putting energy into the things he enjoys doing and not doing some other things. Again, that first half, he looked like he was playing in boots full of molasses. He wasn't going after rebounds. He wasn't trying to block shots. He wasn't rotating. He put up some of the most unusual and ungodly awkward shots I've ever seen. Um, and I understand that Damian Lillard and, and, and I said this, too, before the season started, this is going to be the greatest test of his leadership. I'm not the only one to say it. You said it. Many other people have said it or something similar to that. But I'm just I'm wondering how far Damian Lillard's political capital, if you will, how far his leadership skills are going to get him to Hassan Whiteside to play well. How many more times, I guess what I'm trying to say is how many more times can Damian Lillard shake him by the collar and wake him up and have him play better in the second half before he just doesn't listen to Dame anymore. And I think what, I think what you're describing is a best case scenario. So it's, it's somewhat weighted to start calling black athletes, you know, wondering like, Hey, I wonder how smart they are. That's like, has a very racist history. So I'm, I'm hoping I'm not setting myself up for disaster here, but Kenny Smith's defense of Hassan Whiteside last night during halftime of the game was basically what if he's just not very good at basketball? Like, what if he just is not like, he's just not capable of learning how to play at a high level and making the snap judgments you need to make defensively. See, I don't, I actually don't buy that because again, to my eye and look, I'm not a coach. I'm not an analyst. I'm just some fan with a microphone. He wasn't putting in the effort. It wasn't like he was trying and not doing stuff. It's like, he looked like he wasn't reacting to things in the second half. No, absolutely. But yeah. my, so what I'm getting at is I, I wonder if there's two problems. So problem number one, he's not trying hard a lot. Granted, that's, that's a given. We saw that last night. We saw, we know that Dame yelled at him and, or maybe he watched halftime when he was ignoring the coach. Um, <laughs> and it made a difference in his effort. But if you watch last night, he was still out of position on defense all the time. And if you go back and watch that Dallas game, he was trying in the Dallas game, but he was out of position on almost every single possession in the first half he was involved in. Luka Doncic tore him up, and Luka tears up a lot of people, but at least they can stay between their man and the basket. He was failing at like basic middle school basketball reads. And so my concern is that even if he tries hard, he and he becomes passable like he did in the ha like in the second half last night. They're still going to be when the Blazers play good teams. They're still going to pick him apart defensively, and his effort won't make up for that. That's true, but for me, from where I'm sitting, all I need him to be is passable. That's fine. They just need to not have a gaping hole at center when he's on the court. He needs to at least his presence need to at least needs to deter people. He used to be an amazing shot blocker, isn't so much anymore. Some of his athleticism has left him. I don't think he needs to make perfect reads or even even normal reads as long as it looks like he's putting out some energy. It's it's going to be extremely helpful. And to kind of to, to pivot to the Blazers medium to long term prospects and talking about trades. You and I had an interaction on Twitter about Hassan Whiteside and, and him as a contract more than a player. Um, I think that you had asked whether it would be better if the Blazers had not given up Harkless and Aminu um, and uh, had, just, had just rolled with those people rather than have Whiteside. And my response to you was something along the lines of, well, 
doesn't it make it easier to trade for a larger contract because of the expiring contract that Hassan Whiteside has now? Can you talk a little bit about, in your view, whether or not the Blazers are better positioned to make a trade later in the season, like ignoring how well Whiteside may be playing for the Blazers, but whether it makes it easier or not easier to make a trade later on? It makes it slightly harder, I think, um, unless there's very specific circumstances. The reason I say that is because with Harkless and Leonard, you had two players who were making a collective about $22 million, and that gives you more versatility to make more complex trades. For instance, we already saw how the Blazers, when they traded for Whiteside, sent Leonard and Harkless to two different teams and is th- part of a three-team deal. So now that you only have one contract with Whiteside, you can't chop his contract in half and send it to two different teams. So you lose that multi-team trade flexibility. You also lose the flexibility of going after mid-range con. Almost every single team in the NBA needs to match salary at this point. There's only like $9 million in available cap space in the entire league or something. So what you lose by having Whiteside is, let's say you couldn't find a blockbuster trade using white side, using Leonard plus Harkless, you could say, all right, we can't find a blockbuster, but we can find a guy who's making $12 million and trade one of those players for him. That's out the window now with Whiteside. Now that becomes much more complicated because now you have to send out Whiteside, take back the $12 million player you want, and find another $12 million player on that roster to, go, to take that guy back to. Well, since unfortunately we can't go back in history and, and redo things, the Blazers have him now. Given the landscape of the NBA, given and I know it's only eight games in, but given where teams may think they are in, you know, they want to blow it up or they want to move on from someone. Are there any players around the NBA that you think would be reasonable targets with Whiteside's contract as being the money balancing piece that the Blazers could bring in that would functionally help this team once Nurkic is healthy? Yeah, I think the question is, is um, are the, the Pistons, I mean, the, the pipe dream is always going to be Blake Griffin, right? Because he would fit so perfectly with Damon CJ. And so step number one, you just got to ask if Detroit is ready to do a salary dump, a de facto salary dump, a salary dump for assets trade of Blake Griffin and what their asking price is and what the market for him is. Uh, you sacrificed your free agents space next summer but what that does is that opens the door to retain Kent Bazemore because as it is if you don't trade Whiteside for anything you're kind of choosing between cap space and Kent Bazemore now if you get Blake Griffin you can say all right we got Blake Griffin now we can uh, now we can look into using bird rights to retain Kent Bazemore so I think making a trade for a big salary guy and starting with the the pipe dream is the way to go and I honestly don't think they really have any chance of getting Blake Griffin but you you start by shooting you know shooting for the moon and you work your way down the list why don't you think they could get blake griffin do you think the pistons don't want anything the blazers have to trade i mean they have to understand that they're not going to be contending anytime soon for as well as andre drummond has been playing which you know whatever like i would assume Uh, they understand where they are uh, it's mostly just cynicism because you know it it doesn't happen for the blazers we don't trade for all stars right (laughs) gotta happen at some point (laughs) Um, All right. So Blake Griffin. And I mean, we're not even going to talk about his injury history because for me, like, yes, as a, as a fit, it'd be amazing. I'd be super concerned about uh, him just breaking down. I mean, looking at the size of his knee brace last year was, was just terrifying um, watching him try to play and limp around on that Blake Griffin. Cool. Uh, We've heard a little bit about Kevin love. What are your thoughts on bringing Kevin love? Lake Oswego's finest back to Portland. That's great. But you know, still if you want to go all in, you got to go all in, right? Like I I do think that they have contender potential next year. If they actually truly reinforce, refortify their bench. I do think another run at the conference finals is in play. If they improve the roster, like they have that core of Lillard, Nurkic and McCollum and they have some cap flexibility. So it's, you got to bring in talent and Kevin Love is talented. So why not? So you're you're not one of those people who's like super anti Kevin Love. No, trade. I get that argument though. Like, there's definite potential for like it, it's a gamble, and so you have to you have to be willing to take that gamble. Um, but you gotta you almost have to take a gamble to try to win a title in the NBA, and the the, the window only lasts so long. So. What about a LaMarcus Aldridge reunion with Portland? Also, that would be another, yes, that that would be a perfect fit. We know that LaMarcus and Dame play really well together. We know that Terry Stotts can develop a great game plan for those two. LaMarcus is a solid defender. Um, I could even see him playing a lot, like playing with 
Nurkic without too much trouble. Uh, he's getting slightly older, but there's he's still playing. You know, he's still a borderline all star as it is right now. He's almost one of the more under forgotten players in the NBA. Um, I don't know that you can. San Antonio's not going to. San Antonio is not going to go full rebuild with the young players they have, though. So I don't know what you what you offer San Antonio to entice them that also that that O'Shea is willing to trade because reporters are already joking about how Simons is untouchable, and so if the Blazers aren't willing to give up one of their current. Oh, oh, are they joking though? <laughs> yes. Um, well, that's. I mean, the organization clearly values him very highly, and at least the local reporters who are close to the team and value the relationships with the team are, are echoing that. Yeah, I, my, my point is, though, you're not going to get San Antonio to give up a player that good by saying, we'll throw you a couple 20-something draft picks over the next four seasons. So they're going to have to give up a, a young player who San Antonio perceives as a blue chipper to to get Aldridge, and that I don't know if O'Shea is willing to do that. I'm willing to do that. I don't know if O'Shea is. Uh, yeah, that's fair. Uh, okay, and I know this has become like a, a mock trade podcast now, but I have, I have two more I want to float out there. This player is on a tier below who we just talked about, Aaron Gordon. Do you think that there's any possibility of him playing better in Portland than he has so far this year in Orlando? Would you be interested in that? Yes. He's a little younger. Yes, and yes, okay. super athletic. He, he can shoot, right? Can't he shoot? Am I imagining that? I mean, I, I think this year he's been slightly worse, but yeah, he's demonstrated that he, he has <laughs> the potential to be able to shoot. I think that he, he, he shot a lot better last year than he has been so far yeah, this year. Yeah, I have. I, All right, and so, he's, he's talented. Like he, he's a talented NBA player, right? And he's a like above average starting quality, maybe, you know, like borderline all-star player and needs to be hits his potential. I have zero doubt that Damian Lillard and Terry Stotts can figure out how to play well with someone like that. So yeah, I say go for it again. I don't know what, I think it's too early in the season to know the asking price for a lot of these players. Um, and I think that'll, I think that'll dictate the asking price will dictate who the targets are. I do think like, I think LaMarcus Aldridge not going to happen because of San Antonio's um, the way they handle their, their roster. Uh, Orlando is a little more loosey goosey though. So <laughs> Yeah, no, they, they definitely are. And I mean, your point about the Spurs is a really good one. I just, that's probably the least likely just from a team structure standpoint and pop doesn't, I mean, they're going to want pop to be coaching teams that he at least thinks has a half chance of getting to the playoffs. I mean, people right, are so floating around the green and that's never going to happen. So Aldridge is no less realistic. No, that's definitely, yeah, that's, that's, that's definitely not going to happen. Although. Boy, that would be interesting, but yeah, it's not happening. Okay, here's the last one, and this one um, probably warrants a little bit more thought because all of this talk about trading for anybody and sacrificing any number of draft picks or young players, to me, centers around the assumption that the Blazers have to maximize Damian Lillard's prime. He's 28, 29. He's almost 30. They, in my view, need to do everything they can to make sure these last few years of him being at like peak physical performance, that they had the best possible shot at winning to that end. I floated something on Twitter. Uh, it was a question about whether the Blazers ought to look at trading CJ McCollum and then giving Anthony Simon CJ's minutes, CJ McCollum. Not the youngest player on earth. I think he's also 28. He has a big contract, but he, of, of the players who are not Damian Lillard, I think probably has the most potential value. Would you be interested in exploring the market for a CJ McCollum trade and then just kind of shoving Anthony Simons into that, that shooting guard role? Is that appealing to you? Two at part all? answer. Number one, I don't know if I'm ready to shove Simons into a role as deep or as important as CJ's. I think that might be doing him an injustice and maybe not be entirely fair for his development. That aside, I'm absolutely on board with trading CJ and getting a forward who is a borderline all-star like he is. My follow-up is I, I'm kind of, honestly, I, I don't, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm being too cynical again, but I don't think O'Shea is ever going to be willing to trade him. They just gave him a max extension two years before his contract expired really for no reason. And so I just don't see a scenario where that's even on the table. I agree. I don't want to agree. Um, I also do wonder, though, it seems and tell me if I'm off base here, but it seems that since Jody Allen has become the owner, maybe this is a coincidence or maybe it's not. But it seems like Olshay's moves have been 
slightly more uh, aggressive, maybe not quite the right word, but I, I do wonder whether Paul Allen was heavier in Olshay's ear and shaped some of those personnel decisions more than maybe we understood at the time. And maybe it's just a function of nobody being in his, in his ear. And now he's just operating the way that he wants to operate. Like maybe some of the things that we, um, that we attributed to Olshay's mannerisms as a GM were actually Paul Allen influencing some stuff behind the scenes. And I just wonder if maybe that makes it more likely. Yeah. I, I, I have had the same thought. Um, I think part of a GM's job though, is explaining to his boss while, why certain things are a bad idea. So like, so it's very possible that the driving force behind the disastrous summer of 2016 was Paul Allen. Um, but Olshay's job as a GM is to explain to, to the owner why signing all those guys is a bad idea. So he didn't do it. Um, so I'm not really willing to take all the culpability away from Olshay. With that said, if he is not as enamored with CJ McCollum as we all imagine him to be, why give CJ McCollum a max extension with two years left on his deal this summer? I don't know. <laughs> Can't, I can't answer that. I mean, I don't know if maybe they think that makes him more tradable because he's under contract for longer and he's been relatively healthy. So he's not seen as an injury risk. And I mean, he's a little bit older um, for that argument to make, make as much sense, or maybe it's just a, you know, a, a, a contingency. If they're not able to trade him, at least they have the core locked up for a super long time. I think it's I, the latter. I, I think it's just, they got there. I think it's their ride or die with Nurkic, McCollum and Lillard. And that's, you know, those three are here. Those three are the three. And so and and so I, I I don't I can't imagine a scenario where Elshay trades any of those three um, at least not for unless unless next season also is just a complete disaster and he's flailing to save his job. Okay, well let's look ahead really quick and then we'll get you out of here. Um, the month of November is extremely road heavy for the Blazers and they still have seven more road games remaining. But let's just talk about the next four games coming up uh, today. As we're recording on Friday, November eighth, have a game Friday against the Nets at home, uh, then again Sunday at home against the Hawks, then they hit the road on Tuesday for the Kings, and then come back to Portland the next day to play the Raptors. Uh, in these next four games against the Nets, the Hawks, the Kings, and the Raptors, given what you've seen from the Blazers so far, given that, and actually we kind of, I mean, I forget this. I mean, they played the Clippers, one of the better teams at NBA, Almost beat them. I mean, that's pretty good. Uh, but these next four games, Nets, Hawks, Kings, Raptors, what are you expecting to see from the Blazers in the in this next little piece of the schedule? I, I would guess two wins, maybe three, if everything goes exactly right. The Kings are a gimme because um, they're awful. Uh, the Hawks. So are the Warriors with Eric Pascal. I'm going to, you know, the, the, the Blazers. So, so 2016-17, the Blazers dumped a ton of games to really bad. Like, they, they were, like, they were just – all over the place with consistency. The last two seasons, I they have been very consistent about beating bad teams, competitive but losing generally to good teams. I'm not willing to say that trend has gone away just because of one loss to the off. Like I, I'm, I'm until I see otherwise, I'm going to assume that Warriors loss was a was an aberration. So I'm saying, yeah, yes. it happens. Kings are a gimme because they're the Kings. Um, Nets and Haw Hawks are looking a little better than expected. Nets looking a little worse than expected. So we'll say they, they win one, maybe two of those, if everything goes right, and they lose to the Raptors. So two wins, maybe three. Well, remember, John Collins is suspended, uh, so he's not going to be playing for the Hawks, and he's an important piece of what they've been doing. So might, that game might be a little bit easier. Yeah, I'm just not, you know, I'm not, I'm not willing to, like, I think last year I would have said, oh, they'll win three or four. Um, but I think this year it's just we – we're seeing a lot of early season struggle. We're seeing a lot of struggles with depth and whatnot. And there's there, the, the margin for error is just so low. I'm not ready to say that they can necessarily sweep to solid, if not great Eastern, like East coast teams like that anymore, especially they're tired. They look tired last night too. Like, especially with looking tired, I'm not ready to say they're going to win both of those games. No, I, I, I get that. I, I think if they beat, if I, I do think they should beat the Hawks and the Kings, um, and nothing is guaranteed, uh, I think they have then the next best chance of beating the Nets tonight. Uh, if they do beat the Nets tonight, I hope that they get three of those four. I don't expect them to beat the Raptors. I think the, the matchups there, it's the second night of a back to back. I just, they're traveling. I just, I don't see that happening. Yeah. And the Raptors are very good. The Raptors are very good too. Like there's no shame in losing, like even at full strength, there's no shame in losing to the Raptors. So that's, that's, that's fine. If they lose that one, I think I won't bat an eye unless they get like destroyed by 50. 
Uh, yeah, I hope that doesn't happen. Um, anything else uh, that jumps out to you that you want to mention before we get you out of here? Um, I just, I mean, and let me just interrupt your answer just by saying, and we talked a little bit about this before the podcast. So far this season, this has not been like the most interesting and engaging team to watch, and particularly now without Zach Collins, even more so. Um, how are you holding up as a fan of the team, as somebody who follows the team? What's your interest level looking like right now? Um, so I just tweeted Eric G underscore NBA. I just tweeted the Blazers have an assist percentage of 42.9 right now. Since 1996, only three teams have been below 49%. The 2017 Raptors at 47.2% are the next lowest. So the Blazers are destroying the recent NBA history for like the least ball movement you can imagine. And you know, I've I've written a lot about how ball movement does not correlate with winning games or with good offense, but it does correlate, I think, with <laughs> enjoyment. And so this this lean on Dame as hard as you can. You can appreciate Dame's greatness, obviously, and all due respect to appreciating how good Dame is. But my God, is it boring to watch so far? Watching Dame has been the most fun part of the season. So and Anthony Simons and seeing him go off in the fourth last game was was a lot of fun. Yeah, last night was the first, you know, I've always been very worried. Like they're going to lean like, oh my God, how like this guy played like one meaningful game ever. And now he's going to be in the rotation. And last night was the first time I was like, Whew, okay, maybe we can stop worrying about that a little bit. Cause he looked really good. He did. He even looked good on defense, like watching him and his defensive rotations. Like you're talking about awareness, like they were crisp and he was moving really well. Like I, you know, I don't think he's going to be a world beater on defense, but that's been super encouraging. So no, I was, I was going to say, I never, I never was like, I never didn't believe that some, Simons would be a quality NBA player, but I also was skeptical that he was like that. It's a good idea to put a guy with no experience into a crucial role in a year like this. But I last night I'm starting to come around. A couple more games like last night against good teams, and I'm going to feel really good about that. I'm with you on that. Yeah, it's he 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 looks good. All right, man. Uh, I appreciate you. Appreciate your time. If people wanted to connect with you or find your work uh, or uh, you know argue with your takes, how would they do that? Eric G underscore NBA. I put stuff up on Blazers Edge every now and then. Yeah, you know. We know we know where to find you. Uh, <laughs> all right. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Thank you again to Eric Griffith of Blazers Edge. It's always a blast to have him on. One of my oldest Blazers friends and somebody who I always really enjoy talking to, interacting with on Twitter at Eric G underscore NBA because he is one of the most knowledgeable, clear-eyed people that I follow and like just a super underrated basketball analyst in general. So definitely go check them out if you haven't already with that. That is the end of the episode for now. The Blazers are playing tonight. Uh, why am I struggling to remember that they're playing the Nets? Uh, they're playing at home here in Portland at seven o'clock, hopefully looking for a win in that game, but we shall see. Um, but in the meantime, if you want to follow, I like the Blazers, I would very much appreciate it at, I like the Blazers on Twitter or Facebook. You can also email us at, I like the Blazers at gmail.com. And what would really help if you could just please take a moment, even right now, hit pause or just end the podcast. If you leave us a five-star review, however, you're getting your podcast, but particularly Apple podcasts, it really helps a ton leaving that five-star review and leaving even a comment saying, Hey, this show is not terrible. I would actually really, really appreciate that. So with all of that thank you so much for joining again this is i like the blazers i am brandon goldner and until next time go blazers and thanks a bunch